Thanks for coming out tonight, folks. Uh, this is our sixth um, session of our, our avian archaeology series. And um, like I say, I keep enjoying them more and more every time. So I'm looking forward to tonight. Uh, I am Bill Doley, President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. We're based here in Tucson, where we um, apply our or pursue perhaps our preservation archaeology mission. And I want to start by acknowledging that Tucson is the homeland of the of the autumn. And because this goes out to such a broad reach across the country, I'd like everyone to um, contemplate and acknowledge the indigenous peoples whose your who lands your uh, guests upon tonight. And also want to thank the Smith family, uh, their sponsors of this um, series, and they help make this this happen. So, Eldon, Jean, and Jay, uh, thank you so much for your support. And the just a reminder that there will be an opportunity to ask questions. The little Q and A thing down in the bottom of your screen is the place to ask those. Linda is able to sort through those questions and, and uh, we'll deliver them to, to Kelly tonight. Um, speaking of Kelly, uh, long-term friend, um, really honored to have her here tonight. She's got two positions. Um, she's professor of anthropology at the uh, <coughs> Northern Arizona University, so she's up in Flagstaff tonight. And she's also the curator of anthropology at the Museum of Northern Arizona, two wonderful uh, Northern Arizona institutions. Uh, we're talking with Kelly before the uh, cafe here tonight and about her undergraduate days at, in the University of Michigan, where I also got my undergraduate degree. So uh, welcome for that reason too. Um, and we both got our PhDs at uh, University of Arizona. So a lot of uh, common grounds here. So Kelly's talk tonight, birds, feathers, and ancient Pueblo pottery. Uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. And we're all looking forward to this. And we will, Linda and I will disappear and, and uh, Kelly will take over. Thanks so much, Bill and Linda. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm coming to you from Flagstaff at the base of the San Francisco Peaks a mountain that's sacred to more than 12 tribes, but um, at the Museum of Northern Arizona, we, we work directly with um, 12 tribes who are very concerned about this sacred landscape. And I'll be speaking specifically about Hopi um, history and, and art and, and science. So I want to acknowledge uh, the Hopi tribe um, to start with um, that I am on their lands. And I'll, I'll finish with, with a thank you to, to them and to many museums who have provided images for this presentation tonight. So the, the Archaeology Cafe Online Edition is free, fun, and lively. So I'm going to try to keep it fun and lively by not reading a paper or, or really um, doing very much with um, data as, as science. But this is going to be more of an art appreciation. Um, kind of a presentation where we'll just enjoy some beautiful images and then um, talk about them. And I'll start with an outline. So this is what I'm, I'm planning to, to cover in, in this order, a little bit about um, definitions of the kind of pottery that we're going to be looking at. And then the images of um, macaws and their feathers, eagles and their feathers, um, some other feathered friends like um, turkeys and kestrels and um, ducks and other kinds of birds. And then specifically images on pottery of feathers, um, some of which we can identify to specific birds and um, strings and bundles of, of feathers and how those might, might relate to ancient Hopi worldview and traditional ecological knowledge and, and things like that. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about ancestral Hopi pottery. I've, I've put in the abstract ambitiously that we're going to talk about ancient Pueblo pottery generally, and then I realized that that's probably 
like a mini series or, or even a full blown season of, of something if we include all the Pueblos. So I'm going to focus on pottery, which is where most of my research has been. And if you're interested in learning more about Hopi pottery, um, the Homolavi Archaeological Project out of the Arizona State Museum has published a lot on this. I've published on this, and there are a number of interesting projects in, in the works, um, including a book called Becoming Hopi that has a lot about Hopi history, um, including very deep history from a number of um, Hopi and non-Hopi archaeologists, um, writers, historians, and, and editors from the U of A Press that I recommend that for the, the broad overview. But the, the way we classify pottery, at least based at the Museum of Northern Arizona, is the ware type system. And so the ware is a technological complex from a particular area. And then the types within it are usually stylistic variations that uh, in a sequence through time. And the, the type I'll be focusing on the most is Sikyaki polychrome, which dates from about 1375 up to the founding of the Spanish missions at Hopi in 1629. And the ware is Jedido yellow ware, which starts in about 1325. And what, what really makes this distinct is that it's fired with coal. So a very high temperature, it's very hard. It takes a really nice smooth finish that, that you can paint on in, in a lot of detail. And um, it gives you this beautiful yellow color that, that we're gonna be looking at. Although there's a range from red through orange to, to yellow to almost white. Um, the, the yellow color is very, very striking and very distinctive. Then we have uh, an iron manganese black paint made of local materials and a mineral called gertite that is um, yellow when it comes out of the ground and fires red, a nice red ochre color, and also some white paint. And, um, and that's what we're going to be looking at almost exclusively. And I'll indicate when we're looking at, at other things. So to start with a little bit of history of scientific research on Hopi yellowware or um, Jedido yellowware specifically, we had Jesse Walter Fuchs excavating at a number of sites, including the site of Sikyatki, which is at the base of First Mesa and dates to the, the 1400s, published a couple of books in the, the Bureau of American Ethnology series. Um, out of the Smithsonian that were very popular and are especially popular now with Hopi potters uh, because there's just drawing after drawing of, um, of beautiful pottery, uh, mainly Sikyaki polychrome from the Hopi mesas. But um, less known is Walter Huff and, and his little expedition and, and report from 1901. And he illustrates a few birds here. Fuchs in his book also has a section on birds, so I want to acknowledge that that early rediscovery, um, if you will, of um, this complex of, of bird imagery on Hopi pottery. And then H.P. Mira on the New Mexico side of the Adobe Curtain in 1937 published a little book called The Rain Bird in Pueblo Pottery. And he's taking a more, a broader and a more evolutionary approach to the question of bird imagery on ancestral Pueblo pottery. So he, he's positing a, an early to late, I'm not sure if my cursor is showing up, but the top line is early imagery that he interprets as images of birds, specifically macaws or, or parrots, and getting a little more um, explicit, but, but also very stylized versions. And so we're gonna see the sequence in, in what I'm about to show you, but it's, it's not a rigid uh, temporal evolution, really. Um, and then very stylized Sikyatki polychrome styles. And, and Mira also goes into ancestral Zuni and Akama rainbird imagery and, and other Pueblos. So I recommend this, this little book. It's been reprinted by Dover. It's in the public domain. It's pretty easy to find um, used. But 
before I, I launch into more about macaws, just take, take a look at what some of the distinguishing features are here, this very hooked beak and the long tail feathers, but not all of them have long tail feathers. And so I want you to watch for this because that's, that's significant. If the tail feathers have not grown all the way out, they're juveniles. And that is in fact what the faunal record of, um, of macaws in ancestral Pueblo and um, faunal assemblages is, is showing us. And you could argue that the, the little three-toed feet are not exactly the way macaws feet are. And, and we'll notice that as we go along a little bit too. So these are naturalistic depictions. These are very stylized. And in some cases they might represent uh, a lot of birds, like birdness, all birds. So we'll watch for that. So we do know that macaw feathers were used in the past. So this is a piece from Navajo National Monument, which should be called Coestima in um, Hopi, which is really a, a Carizan word, and, and that just goes to show. So we have red macaw feathers on uh, a little fiber artifact that this is probably uh, a necklace or a, a little piece of um, adornment for a prayer stick. And then on the right, I'm showing you some contemporary feathers from a, a starlet macaw that um, Chris Downham, I think, purchased online and did some gorgeous photos of um, with Ryan Belknap and, and Dan Boone here at NAU. And Chris's point was just to show the brilliant colors of these feathers when they would have been used. And then archeologically they fade a bit over time. And this one um, from Coestima is unusually well preserved with that, that bright color, but, but feathers are also very vulnerable to insect damage. So we don't get a lot of them in the archeological record. And just as a reminder of, of what the, the feathers would have looked like when they were new. Here's a depiction of macaws from the late 1200s. And this is not Jedido yellowware, this is White Mountain redware, but this particular area of um, Kintil or Wide Ruins and, and Ganado, um, east of the Hopi Reservation and northwest of Zuni is a, a really interesting area in that the, the pottery technology is very much like ancestral Zuni pottery technology or what you would see um, on the, in Eastern Arizona along the Maguillon Rim, Cibola Whiteware and White Mountain Redware technology. But the style is this fabulous fusion of Kayenta style um, from the Hopi Mesas and north of there. And also elements from Mesa Verde as you've got people migrating into this area coming down the Chisca Mountains from Mesa Verde. So not everyone from Mesa Verde went to the Rio Grande. Some of them came into what's now Arizona as well down the west side of the Chiscas. And so you get this fabulous fusion of styles. And that's really the foundation of this um, Jedido style that we're, we're going to be looking at from the 1300s. So you've got four macaws here with the long tail feathers rotating around a, a center element. And in the Mesa Verde area, you will get single macaws on the exterior of black on white bowls in the mid 1200s. And then this, um, this element develops a little later in the, the later 1200s with um, either two macaws paired or four. And the, the symmetry is usually rotation. And you also start to get a little asymmetry. So we have uh, one with a white wing, a white wing, a white wing, and then a solid black one. And this introduction of asymmetry is something you're gonna see develop through the sequence in both the geometric elements and the, the life forms. So by the mid 1300s in Jedido black on yellow, we've got paired macaws, that very stylized um, version with the long tail feathers, rotational symmetry. So that movement. And here's one with only two macaws, so paired and one's colored and one's plain, one has um, something in its, its beak or a little adornment added to it. And this is probably in the late 1300s. We've got um, 
a, a completely asymmetrical layout. There's, there's still a, a feeling of rotation, but, but it's not a symmetrical design. And there's the little feeties on this one to the little three-toed feet. Now, some of these I've, I've built, um, I've done my own tracings or I've used tracings from the Harvard Peabody Museum that Harriet Cosgrove did. And I'm, I'm using these drawings for a couple of reasons. Sometimes the, the pottery is misfired or it's fragmentary, it's hard to photograph, or I just didn't photograph it well when I was in the, the lab at, at Harvard looking at this particular collection is from Awatavi on the east side of the Hopi Mesas on Antelope Mesa. It's a site that had a, a Spanish mission on it. And the other reason for using drawings besides just you can see it better is that when you draw it yourself, you really learn the designs. You just really start to understand the, the symmetry and the, the elements of these. It kind of slows you down and you dig into it a little deeper. So I'm gonna share some of my, my drawings here and um, explain a little bit about the temporality of, of these in the 1300s. This is a black on orange piece from either the late 1200s or the early 1300s. And then we get into the black on yellow pottery that's coal fired that's after 1325. But these, these three are probably all in, in the 1300s solidly and just some of the, the variations there. And this, for example, you might not guess it was a macaw unless you had seen HP Mira's work or set up a sequence like, like this for yourself by, by laying out a lot of potential examples. This little piece down here is my, my attempt to render a Zuni glazeware paint where the paint's a little bit runny, green color, shiny. And this is really just a couple of brush strokes to make this macaw. And this would have been a tradeware to a lot of the, um, the, the glazed paints have been sourced to the Zuni area. And this Pinoa black on white is very common or glaze on white is very common in the Zuni area. So, so we know there's interaction from being able to determine where pottery was made and then where it's found. And you likewise find the coal fired yellowware pottery in Zuni sites like Hawiku as well. So we know there was a lot of interaction prehistorically as well as um, right up to the present day. Then in, in the 1400s, I think we've got a lot more craft specialization going on. We have fewer Pueblo sites in the, the Hopi history tradition and we have, so there are fewer sites, there are larger sites. So they're aggregated Pueblos, people are migrating in still. Um, some of them probably from the Rio Grande. And you just have uh, a real explosion of stylized imagery and colors and brushwork techniques, engraving, spattering, this kind of dry brush technique that I've tried to emulate here, and a lot more detail in some of the bird images, but, but also the stylized version continues. So take a, a look at how this head is. It's a very distinctively macaw with the hooked beak and then this curved um, under beak. And, and they have a, a, a cute tongue that they use a lot. They use their, their beak and tongue like a third hand. And that's indicated in some of these. And we're going to see a few vessels where this is the only part that you've got. So we're trying to build from some fairly naturalistic designs to recognizing more stylized elements. And this just, just becomes unbelievably elaborate in, in some of these pieces. So here's a, a macaw, but it's got uh, something fancy on its head that the real bird would, would not have. And just lots of of colors and probably some turkey feathers up here that with the blunt square um, shape and the white tips. Come back to that. And these macaws are, this is not what a macaw's feather pattern looks like. And if I was in a, a class or in a situation where I could interact with you, I'd say, does anybody know what that is? 
and if Lori Webster's on, she knows what that is. Um, that's a tie-dye textile. So the, these macaws are wearing tie-dyed textiles. So that's not what the real birds wear. You know, there's something else going on here um, symbolically. These are our textile designs that you see on pottery and in the Kiva murals. And, and Lori has published extensively on, on that with um, a little assistance from me. And then these have the what looks like a wing at first glance. This also has the beak. So you've got a naturalistic macaw with a stylized macaw sitting on it. The red tail feathers down here. And then this is not a crest. The macaw does not have a head crest like some birds. This is an eagle feather. And this offset black tip is the shorthand in, in Hopi iconography for an eagle tail feather. So there's, there's a lot going on here. And it's meaningful. I can't read it like a book. I don't, I don't know um, what that means. I'm not initiated into that level of, of knowledge, but um, there, there's something deeply meaningful going on there with that, that level of detail and combining of elements. Then here we're in the mission period, and I think this is the only one I'm showing from this time period. Um, generally, the pottery in the mission period is less complicated. It's, um, the clay isn't as well processed. It's not as well painted, but there are examples like, like this that, that are very well executed and symmetrical and the, that rotational symmetry is, is continuing, but we have rotation going two ways here, um, clockwise and counterclockwise with the stylized birds. And that's, that's pretty unusual. I don't think I've seen that from the, the pre-mission period. Okay, back, back to the late 1300s. Here's a, I'm gonna show you a couple of macaw effigy vessels and bird effigies go all the way back to the 600s. They're, they're very early vessel form, but they get particularly elaborate in, in the Jedido yellowware. So here's a early Sikyatki polychrome macaw effigy. And there are two of these at the Field Museum from Homolavi. And one from Homolavi that's at Brigham Young University. No, it's from Four Mile Run. Um, and it's in the Brigham Young collections. And then there's another one in a private collection that, that was documented as having been looted from Homolavi. And um, to have four vessels that I swear look like they're made by the same person, the head is so detailed and constructed in the same way is, is really very interesting with um, three of them coming from Homolavi and one from, from Four Mile near Snowflake Taylor. So all of them are trade wares from off the Hopi Mesas, but, but very, very detailed macaw vessels. And a contemporary potter, Rachel Naminga Nampeo, created this one um, after viewing the, the ones in the museum collections. And she's done the, the head shape, but she chose a, a design from a Gila polychrome vessel. And that, that may be referring, I haven't talked to her about this, but that, that may be referring to the clans that came from the South and the macaw being associated with the sun and summer in the South for, for Hopi and being important in, in Hopi clan migrations. So this is more of a Salado um, design than, than the ones that were made on, on Hopi. So this kind of cultural synthesis continues today. And then also Rachel is Hopi Tewa, um, one of the descendants of a community of Tewas that, that came from New Mexico after the Pueblo Revolt. So this kind of movement and, and synthesis is a part of the pottery tradition we're, we're talking about. I, I also went through some of the pot shirts um, at the Harvard Peabody when I was there studying this collection and the, the excavators, Joe Brew and, and his team and Hattie Cosgrove as the, the ceramic analyst there um, pulled out interesting pot shirts. So the ones with life forms faces and animals and birds on them. So we have a, a pretty good representation of life form imagery on, on pottery from the site, even the fragmentary ones. So this is a katsina, a 
spirit being ancestor, they bring all good things to Hopi. And we start to see them depicted in the pottery in this area in the 1300s, as well as in petroglyphs and, and a little bit later on Kiva murals. And this one looks a lot like the long hair Katsina that dances today that has a long black beard and long black hair that, that represents the, the summer rain clouds and the rain, the rain that comes down, that streams down from the, the thunderheads in the, the summer. You've got some engraving through the black paint. You've got several shades on the face. And to me, that complex of, of color suggests that, that this is from the 1400s. And then look what he's got on his head. Just these three stripes are almost certainly scarlet macaw tail feathers. And, and that is what the long hair Katsina wears today, whereas one coming up from the back of the head. And, and here it's, it's three on, on top of the head, but I think very clearly related and a, a, a case of continuity from the 1400s to the present. Not all Sukiyaki polychrome was made by craft specialists, although a lot of it seems to have been formed very well by craft specialists, formed and polished, and then handed off to a beginner to paint. So here's, here's somebody who's not completely competent with painting Sukiyaki polychrome, yet they're learning, they're doing a, a better job than I could, but, but not the, the level that we've seen or will see on some of these vessels, you know, we're, we're crowding up against the, the framing line, the brush strokes are short and um, just, just not quite as, as good line control as, as we see in, in a number of vessels that, that make it into art museum catalogs. And then here's, the, here's our little bird friend here with a, the macaw head and the little three-toed feet, but a fan-like tail that's much more characteristic of a, an eagle or turkey tail. This is not what a macaw tail looks like. So is this an effort to show a juvenile macaw with short tail feathers, or is this one of these hybrid birds where this just represents all birds? And, and um, somebody who's learning to paint isn't as specific or as naturalistic as a, a master painter might be. Here's one clearly by a, a master painter. And here's that stylized macaw beak with the hook and then the round um, lower beak and some kind of a feather bundle here of red feathers. And then these also look like they could be stylized bird parts or, or macaw parts. And then this little guy over here, again, is painted by somebody who's not that great at painting. And this could be a macaw beak with the, the short under beak and the big upper beak and eyes, and then kind of a red um, crop area. But this, this could also be something else. It's just not very specific and it's fragmentary. We don't have wings or tail or anything to, to help us, but um, we have a couple of depictions of turkey vultures that have a, um, an opening in the beak um, that goes right, like right through the beak um, where the light shows through holes right through and it could be representing that that bird. So sometimes it, it's just not specific enough to, to identify the bird to um, the species level. So let's take a look at some eagle feathers and the variations in eagle feathers. So the basic version is this offset black tip and it gets shown on the heads of, of figures like this. Again, this is a tracing of a, a not very well painted um, pot shirt, alternating with probably macaw tail feathers, but they, they could also be red tail hawk feathers or some other kind of um, raptor with a, a red tail feather, very often alternating um, in a, a fan-like pattern around a face that um, might represent the sun. Both macaws and eagles are associated with the sun in the ethnography. And then I love this one up here, 
the, the split feather format is, is something you see to the present day in the Carrizan Pueblos along the Rio Grande, as well as um, the historic Acoma pottery, the, the split feather design. Very, very, very common all over the Pueblo world in the 1700s. But clearly an eagle feather with that offset in it. And then we have this little tie-dye textile design, or ethnographically, that represents corn. So it's the kernels of corn with that germ of life in them. So this eagle feather with a, a corn design on it, and another kind of hybrid idea being expressed there. Eagle tail feathers are often shown in a fan-like array on shields like this shield figure with a, a casino like face up here and eagle tail feathers and then feathers with red tips in the middle. And then this is one of my favorite pieces from the Field Museum of Natural History. Um, you have this divided design field and the spattered paint indicating moisture or this is this is underwater this is happening in the underworld but it's upper world imagery and that it's eagle tails but you have human legs and feet and then an eagle tail in in the middle here and then you have what may be hummingbirds but could be butterflies or dragonflies sipping from the water surface and what what could be water plants here but potentially also feather feather bundles like, like we're about to look at. So something very complicated going on here. And then you have tadpoles on the outside also indicating a, a pool of water, a spring, which is a, an access point to the underworld and, and ancestors and moisture. And uh, there, there are quite a few of these vessels that, that seem to refer to the hydrological cycle where water underground rises up um, and comes out of mountains like the San Francisco peaks. We call it orographic precipitation in, in science speak, but we're, we're thinking about traditional ecological knowledge that, that water underground becomes water in the form of clouds that then falls as, as rain and springs are very important access points to that hydrological cycle. So I think we're seeing something being said about that in, in that vessel. And the, the bird feathers have something to do with that. So here's a, a bird effigy vessel with, um, I, I couldn't decide which photo was better. So I just put, put both, but we were using a mirror at the time. This is back when we were using slides and I was a graduate student or I think tribal archeologist at one point when I was doing some of this research and uh, we, didn't, we didn't have money to take two slides. So we would use a mirror and take one slide and try to get two views in, in one. So that's what's going on here. But here's a, a bird effigy vessel with a tail that has yellow and red feathers and then these interesting wing feathers with that split feather design, but it's not the eagle design. It's, it's, it's not the completely um, step-like, it's, it's pointed here. And, and then the bird has this crop that's, that's colored red sticking out here. And um, very, very stylized. I don't think you can tell what, what species that is, but if anybody has any ideas, we can, we can come back to it but it, it may be a specific species. Then depictions of, of turkey feathers have blunt squared ends and, and white tips. And this particular one is very detailed. This is engraved through the paint after it dried, but before the vessel was fired. And it's, it's showing a bundle of turkey feathers. And this, this is an example where the it's kind of hard to see what's going on in the, the shirt, but um, drawing it helped give me a better idea of, of what was going on in that design. And there's a, a story about why the turkey's feather is, has a white tip. And that's the, the emergence story from the, the underworld, 
the, the people at a, a large community to the south called Palatkwapi or Red House or Palatpavi Red Lake House um, or Red Walled City um, had a lot of dysfunction and competition and weren't doing the rituals right and were gambling too much and um, uh, infidelity, marital infidelity and all kinds of problems. And, and so um, the village, long story short, um, the village was destroyed by the water serpent and the water serpent caused earthquakes and water to rise and destroy the village. And the, the, the good people had warning and were able to escape. So people are, are fleeing this flooding village. The floodwaters are, are rising. And the turkey is kind of, a, he's kind of bad at flying. He's a ground-based, earth-based bird. And um, the turkeys are trying to flee and follow the people who, who are, are keeping these, these birds. These are domesticated turkeys at this point. And the, the turkey is lagging behind and trying to catch up. And the floodwaters are, are rising so fast that the, um, the tail feathers are dipped in the foam of the rising water. And that's why the, the tips are still white. And you know, that's the kind of story that is, is in several pueblos and, and is told to children. And there are, there are deeper levels of meaning that are revealed to um, initiates as, as people grow up in the tour. But that's, that's the version that, that we as outsiders would get. And here's turkey feathers on probably a face. And there's the, the blunt shape and the white tips, again, in this kind of mottled or barred appearance of the, the feather. An elaborate one from the Museum of Northern Arizona. This part is is a reconstruction where where the paint's a little washy. That's plaster that's been painted over. We don't do that anymore. Um, but here's a a bird figure with a flower on it. So a composite symbol again. And this one, my Audubon pals have identified as a stellar jay, which we have a lot of here in Flagstaff. So it's associated with the the San Francisco Peaks, it has a, a blue color, but you can't do blue um, with fired on pottery paint. You, you, you'd have to add it as a post-firing treatment, but it has a bit of a crest. It has this really distinctive eyebrow that always makes it look angry. And, it, and it, they will scold you just for, just for being there. And then this is a detail that you don't really see just by looking at it at your bird feeder, but Obviously, Hopi ancestors got up close and personal with these birds. This is some, um, oh, now I can't remember the scientific term, but uh, most insect eating birds have these, these little feathers above the beak. And this, this version over here is even more stylized. You've just got the crest and the, the eyebrow, but, but not the little um, supra beak feathers or whatever those are called and um, very, very stylized tail feathers there on those. Okay, now I wanna get a little more into some uh, pots that look kind of abstract at first glance, but when you, when you get into this with a, a biologist like Chuck LaRue, you, you start to realize that these aren't just pretty patterns, these are very specific bird feathers. And Hopi consultants know why these feathers are, are strung in the particular order that they're strung in and what they mean and what these are prayers for. So all of these do represent prayers that are, that are carried um, from, from humans to the upper world. So feathers are, are light, they rise, they're associated with, with breath and, and upward movement. So, on, on this one, Chuck and I have um, overlaid Hattie Cosgrove's drawing of this pot and then tried to identify what those feathers are. So you have turkeys and several kinds of kestrel feathers, magpie, roadrunner, eagle, um, which you can recognize by now. And um, the, the black tip is, is not a macaw feather, that's a, a kestrel with the black tip. 
And we're, we're really not seeing the, the parrot set on here. And there's probably something about the seasonality of these particular birds that they may be associated with particular kinds of, of weather, like when the snow comes or they might be associated with hunting or there's probably a reason for grouping of, um, of this variety of, of feathers and the inclusion of some and the exclusion of others. And um, these barred feathers, um, Chuck thinks are probably kestrel. So this pot has just kestrel feathers. And this one could potentially be all kestrel, but just different parts of, of that bird. There's the black tip and this barred one and the, the black with the, the red bars with two different shapes. And on some of these, Chuck can tell you if it's a wing feather or a tail feather and, and all of that. So um, a bundle with a turkey feather here, um, this barred kestrel or potentially canyon wren and the, the magpie and roadrunner feathers there. And then this might be a prayer stick in here. That may not be a feather. That might be something that's added. And some, some prayer sticks have pine needles or other um, materials, specific plant materials added to them as well. So there's a, a grammar to these things that's, a, again, a composite symbol. There's a message there um, based on, on what is included and tied together and um, prayed with. And that's, that's really all that, um, that I can say appropriately about those. Here's another feather bundle with the, the very obvious turkey feather here. And maybe it's being carried in the hand by this katsina, we don't know, but this is very likely a, a katsina. And this probably dates to the, maybe even into the 1500s. I, I would give this one 1500s probably. Then um, moving from those very realistic depictions to something like this, you might not have known that was a feather bundle unless you had seen the more naturalistic depictions and then you move to the more stylized or simplified ones like this. And you say, ah, that's a feather bundle on, on this vessel. And this is also very, very abstract. Here's another one of those div um, divided design fields where maybe it's the upper world, the underworld, the sky world underwater. Maybe it's the spirit world, this world. Maybe it's um, some other duality. That, that we don't recognize as, as outsiders today, but um, you've got some very stylized, probably wing feathers here and then this tail fan, but it seems to be potentially made up of, of feathers from a variety of different birds. So potentially more like a, a feather bundle. So, um, I guess one of the things I'm saying is if you just found this vessel, you might not recognize that as feathers unless you had seen the, the more naturalistic end of the, the continuum. And that's all the, the slides I've got. And I wanna thank all kinds of museums and people. And I am ready to take some questions. All right, Kelly, thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, and we can come back to pictures if people want to. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll let them look at my beautiful sweater. <laughs> they can look at my scarf with the birds on. Yeah, it. show us the scarf. <laughs> yeah, I wore my bird scarf just for just for tonight. It's hard for me to show, but <laughs> no, that's fascinating. So it's such a nice opportunity to see some so many of those images. That's very it was very nice. Yeah. So. Let's see, we have some questions. Let's Good. see. Um, so, well, okay, so the pots with the feather bundles, um, do you know what they might've been used for? What their purpose function might've been? Were they carrying water? Do you know what they're- We don't know. Some of them are perforated, which suggested there might be a strap that, uh, and this is pre-firing perforations, not, not drilled in later. So they might have been designed to be carried on a, a strap, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's possible that they were used in kiva rituals, but that's not really um, the kind of information that gets shared with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. 
Well, actually, as a follow up on that point, um, someone asks, um, in general, what what do the Hopi think of your work? Do you want to address that a little bit more? <laughs> Which Hopi? Well, yeah, yeah there is. Yeah, <laughs> it, de it depends. Um, I get a lot of accolades and a lot of interaction with potters because they're very interested in having access to what I would call a data set and they would call um, their intellectual property mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a sense being returned. Although Jimmy Note um, from Zuni would say, you can call it digital repatriation. It's digital, but it's not repatriation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but until the Hopi tribe gets their own museum, which they're working on, and, and they would very much like to hear from anybody who'd be interested in financially supporting. <laughs> such a such an endeavor yeah. um until they get their own museum um the, the best that that i can do from where i sit is is document and share mm -hmm. the images both with the the tribal government um and the the artists themselves especially potters and uh, a number of potters use the ancient work as inspiration mm -hmm. So, so they are out there on, on the landscape looking at, at the fragments on the ground, but to, to see hundreds or even thousands of whole vessel images um, like, like museums can, can provide to them. So uh, some of this, the, the data that I was showing or what to me is data yeah. um, was a, a set of images that the, the Hopi tribe requested images from uh, museums all over the country who, who then um, scanned some slides or took some photos and, and sent them. And we've tried to put together a database, but the intellectual property issues are pretty difficult mm. to, to just like have an online for the public catalog. And we're getting there with digital humanities projects, but it's, it's expensive and it, it has a, a lot of difficulty around um, credit lines and different museums having different protocols. But it's all been shared with the tribe, mm -hmm. and um, at Museum of Northern Arizona, we're kind of one of the informal data repositories for that. So tribal members can request to mm -hmm. have copies of of these images. So they wouldn't they would need permission from the museums to publish them, but to to just use them for their own purposes, it's it's perfectly um, free for the asking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Great. So, um, so macaws are rel relatively common on ancient pottery after about 1300 in the northern mm -hmm. southwest, as yep. you were telling us. But we're this speak this questioner is telling me that the actual birds are not. <laughs> so, right. Do you have any idea why this might be? I do, <laughs> and I hope you'll be hearing to, you'll be hearing this to Pat Gilman if you want directly. Exactly. So. <laughs> so you'll be hearing more about this from Pat Gilman and Christopher Schwartz. Yeah. And why? We're why working so on. many macaws, but not actual birds? They're really, really important as clan symbols, as symbols of the sun and south. They're important in um, migration stories about cultural identity. And they may have been and talked to Pat and uh, Mark Thompson about, um, especially for membrace, whether they were sacrificed at the vernal equinox um, when they were about a year old, just as those the tail feathers are, are growing out. So a lot of them in the, the faunal record are juveniles. And we have them at in Membrace, at Chaco sites, mm -hmm. and um, the Homolavi sites, ancestral Hopi and Zuni sites. And um, so in small numbers and in quite a few places, Wapaki has the most, um, Chris Schwartz will, will tell you mm -hmm. okay. at some point. But these are tropical birds. They were imported to the area and probably did not breed further north than Chihuahua. And that would have been some kind of artificial breeding program at Paki May. But I better let I better not go any further and let let Pat handle that one. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they're they're depicted way more often than they're yeah. actually. Yeah. I have um, yeah, I've just got a question here asking, do you think this suggests a connection with Pocky May? So we'll say indeed, we'll answer yes. that one in <laughs> and next more next in a couple months yeah. or so. Yeah. Yeah. Um there were just a couple. Oh, okay. So we have a couple questions about yellowware. Okay. okay, you like yellow well or anywhere. I know you do. Everybody loves yellow so, wear. <clears throat> well, so first of all, was was it only the yellow wear that's coal fired 
Yes. And are the Hopi still coal firing? Yes, some of them. Some of them are. Um, there was a shift to to sheep dung um, historically, and that's because buying a truckload of sheep dung from Navajos is a lot easier than mining your own coal, and it's a lot safer. And there's a, so there's a mutually beneficial relationship there. And the dung burns really long, and is is a little more forgiving. Mm -hmm. But um, but Bobby Silas is reviving coal firing, and a number of the first Mesa potters um, do a combination of of dung and coal, and then you kind of get the benefits of both the high mm -hmm. temperature of coal and the more buffering effect of mm -hmm. and the longer lasting um, dung. Hmm. So it's a good combination. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, that's that's cool. Um, let's see, I've got questions coming fast and furious. I had some I wanted to ask. And where is that one? I Oh, I like, yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you about this one. Uh, we have a, you know, listener, viewer, and she, she says, um, can you comment on the notion of potters as storytellers, especially as the ones with the deeper layers of knowledge? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think, I think that's a great way to phrase it is they are yeah. telling a story. And Ruth Bonzel, who's a, I should have mentioned, in addition to H.P. Mira, so in that kind of 1930s era, um, Ruth Bonzel was talking to a lot of um, potters, especially at Zuni, but, but also a few at Hopi and in the, in the Rio Grande and Acoma. And mm -hmm. I think it was the Zuni, one of her Zuni Potter consultants said that this is the form of prayers that women do. And so men make those the prayer feather bundles and prayer sticks and and women paint those prayers on on pottery. And and you can think of the prayers as being a kind of story as well, but there there also could have been histories of clan migrations might be expressed in this way. And uh, a lot of rituals are really stories, and um, I, I hesitate to, to mention Navajo in, the, in this context, but there's, a, there's kind of a more public access to some of the Navajo ceremonies than, mm -hmm. than there is to um, Pueblo ceremonies, which are, are held more closely. And mm -hmm. if, you, if you look into some of the Navajo chant ways, a lot of them are, are really stories. Mm -hmm. That's the so the patient is experiencing along with the the holy people. Yeah. Sometimes a, a migration or or learning how how a holy person learned a ceremony and the places they visited in order to perform that ceremony. So I, I definitely think these are stories. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a really interesting way to think about it. Yeah. 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 Um, Potter was um, pointing out a Potter friend, a Potter friend. It said it's easier. It's just easier to stylize images when you're making the same shape of a pot. And she's she's remarking on it's curious why you you don't see similar. Do you see similar stylization in the rock art imagery of birds? Because like the the yeah. imagery is it the same or different? It's the same. It is the same. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, except for you have this layer. So there's there's the triangular body macaws and shields with eagle feathers. You see that in petroglyphs. But mm -hmm. um, what you don't see in petroglyphs is the really elaborate fine line. Um, yeah. And the feather bundles and the, the strings. I have never seen those in rock art. It might be that, that some of that's just difficult to produce yeah or the context you know i yeah, think yeah. going back to the first question about how the pots with the feather bundles on yeah. them are used it's it would be a very different if they're if they're used in kiva ritual mm -hmm. that would be different from rock art which is a more public mm -hmm. place marking yeah kind of activity yeah yeah um can you tell us about connections between the four rotating macaws and possible blanket like designs do you know what yeah, yeah, and I don't know, <laughs> and again, I don't know the layers of meaning on that, but textiles are associated with clouds in the sky, uh -huh. and so are the birds, uh -huh. and mm -hmm. a lot of times textiles are, are depicted with their tassels, their corner tassels, and, and, and again, um, Pueblo and um, Navajo weaving, people might just be a little more familiar with 
Navajo weaving, but both of them, it's the same technology. They're using an upright loom and they're using a continuous warp mm -hmm. and then the weft going this way. So it's an integral piece with no natural fringes or cutting mm -hmm. or anything. It's a, a whole integral piece, mm -hmm. but you, you add these tassels or just the way it's tied off, especially when you're using edge cords, you'll have these tassels mm -hmm. at the end. And it just kind of looks to me like somebody has said, I'm going to make my tassels look like macaws. Oh. So, ah. Yeah, there's, but there, it's all sky imagery. So there's, yeah. there's that for sure. And then there's just the idea of perhaps of, of playing with some resemblances and, and just kind of drawing them out. Mm. Mm. I don't know. Mm. What about the rotational symmetry itself? Is, is that a sky thing as well? No, that goes way, way back. Okay. And um, back to Basket Maker 3, that rotational symmetry is just mm -hmm. really common. It's just what you and, do. And you do start to get a variety of symmetries in the 1300s, but it's almost all rotational up to that point. And you can read Dorothy Washburn on this mm -hmm. for, she'll go a little further than I will and what mm -hmm. that means, that it, it has to do with interpenetrating dualities and movements and this, this constant um, balance in motion um, that the Pueblo worldview entails. So light, light and dark are balanced, um, the, the sun and the moon, the night sky, the day sky, um, potentially the, the macaw and the raven in, in a couple of stories are, are a duality. And mm -hmm. but the idea that these dualities aren't static, but that they're interpenetrating and in motion. So it's more of a yin yang to use a, an Asian analogy than, than it is a Western fixed category opposition. Yeah. Speaking of ravens, um, have you seen ravens on the pottery? Not that I can identify, no. no. Okay. But it, it may yeah. just be that there, there's birds that are black, but when, when yeah. your color palette is pretty much limited <laughs> to um, black, red, and yellow. Right. <laughs> And white, you know, that's what you're going to get. So when you got a black and white macaw or, or, or a, a black and red bird with the macaw beak, you can say, okay, that's probably, you know, they're, they're drawing the outlines in black and then the, they might give you a little red infill mm -hmm. or the um, magpie where they're, they're deliberately doing a black and white on, on yellow. Mm -hmm. um, but black on just an all black bird. A lot of them are all black, but yeah. they, they have that really hooky beak. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I think it's a macaw. And then the, the raven does have a, a shorter, broader tail. And I'm not seeing that very often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the blue and the blue and the, and the macaws? Because I guess, you know, because of how the blue is created in feathers, because it's from interference, it's not a pigment so much that, do we see blue feathers? Have we, have we ever seen, have you, have you seen blue feathers in collections? Do they survive as blue? Do you know? No, you wouldn't on pottery. Yeah, but um, I mean like your feathers. Firing stuff. application, but. Um, Actual feathers? Is, no. And in the Kiva yeah. murals, we don't have, they could do blue in the Kiva do, murals and right. they, they add azurite pigments and you do right. have blue colors in them, but we don't see them putting blue on the birds. Huh. They're, they're just black and red. The red. So hmm. again, it's a stylization or a, a selection. There's also different populations of macaws though. And, and um, Kelly Taylor could speak to this where some of the scarlet macaw populations from different parts of, of Mexico and South America have, have different combinations of feathers in addition to the scarlet. Mm -hmm. There's some are more red than others. Some have more, more, more blue and some have green. And I'm not clear on that. Huh, cool, cool. Um, let's see, we're coming up on seven o'clock. I'm trying to see if there's any, here comes the train, y'all, in case you All missed right. the train. <laughs> it's a tradition of the cafe. Um, I'm just right. trying to see if there's any other final questions I wanted to ask, but we are coming up around seven. Um, oh, this was an early on, just to throw out there. You talked about Mira and his book about Rainbird. Why is uh -huh. it? Why is it called Rainbird? Well, I think he was speculating as much as anything. Okay. Uh, because some some Pueblo 
consultant said that you know the bird is about about rain mm -hmm. but um you know realistically when you when you talk to more than more than a few pueblo people everything is about rain <laughs> And the other things that you need for your crops are warmth and the sun. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the macaw potentially comes in and talk to Pat Gilman about this, but ah. um, the vernal equinox sacrifices to make sure there's enough warmth to, to germinate and, and right. grow the crops. And some birds are associated with snow because mm -hmm. they come when the snow is about to come, like they come ahead of the snow. Right. Like you'll see flickers at your bird feeder right before it snows. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is tradi traditional ecological knowledge where each bird's behavior is related to the weather in some way. And because it's not a linear causality, the bird is bringing the snow. And mm -hmm. so, the bird brings the snow or brings the rain or brings the warmth. So, so I think Miro was just focused yeah. on it, it, or his hook, you know, yeah. was that, that some of these are associated with moisture. And I didn't even go into water birds, which yeah. you will see in rock art to the long legged cranes. And there is a crane clown and there's cranes in the Kiva murals and those are yeah. about water. And ducks are of course about water, but I think I only found one duck on on Hopi oh, okay because yeah people were wondering about ducks too okay great ducks yeah. are more important in zuni than they are in, mm -hmm. in hopi and it's probably just the local environment and the, where the flyways are and where the, mm -hmm. the wetlands are yeah well there was there was there's been a couple questions we'll ask this then we'll have to wrap it up but um you showed us a bunch of um the effigy the effigy vessels and stuff mm -hmm. and we were just wondering about how those are are made are those are those parrot beaks actually um, spouts and stuff? Or are they just are they just a handle or how are those? Yeah, well, both some of both. both. But okay. those were actually the the set of four, and I only showed one of them. Mm -hmm. um, th those are spouts. Okay, cool. Okay, interesting, interesting stuff. Now this is fascinating. Gosh, you can tell you've spent many many years and hours thinking about what this all looks like and. <laughs> What it all is, what's going on? The, the, the Hopi tribe gathered this um, this set of images uh, initially um, 20 years ago. So we've had a long time to to look at it, and potters have had a long time to to try out replicas yeah. and, and play with this imagery. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. We've had a great time. Lots of people here. I'll ask Bill to come on back. But thank you so much, Kelly. It's been <laughs> Thanks for having time. me. Many, many people are sending their thank yous on the Q&A oh, as well, so. I'll have to open that up and take a look. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, so. Oh, I'm sure some of these you'll get to later, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Bill, there's well, Jay I'll, wrap us up here. I'll definitely express my thanks, Kelly. Very, very um, helpful to get insights into how to look at these um, images and, and so on, so. Um, just real quick, um, we're wrapping up our, our um, we're in the final stretch of our uh, avian archaeology series, and we're actually moving back to a focus on turkeys next time, but we started with three in a row on turkeys, and actually I was counting, and Kelly did keep the mention of turkeys alive tonight, 12 mentions of turkeys as <laughs> in her talk, the quantitative data comes back. Um, so thanks, Kelly, for, for that. And next uh, month on April 5th, so the first Tuesday in April, Rachel Berger is going to uh, come um, to our living rooms and uh, talk to us about a rafter of burials, Sapaowinge turkey interments. So um, put that on your calendar and uh, it's our penultimate um, session in our avian archaeology series. But thank you, Kelly, for making this one such a wonderful presentation. And yep. thank you all folks for, for joining us tonight. Yep. Thank you all. Have a good evening, everybody. Good night. <laughs>